I'm Professor David McGuinness. I'm Chief Executive Officer of Earthwatch Australia. Earthwatch's mission is to connect people with science through citizen science programs directed at sustainable futures for our planet. Citizen science is where ordinary members of the public become involved in scientific research programs, where they volunteer to assist scientists in the field. They might be collecting specimens, they might be making observations, they might be analysing samples. And what that achieves is it multiplies the effect of the scientists in the field. And the other benefit is that we have many more advocates for science and the importance of scientific research in the community. Australia has some of the world's leading scientists working in various fields. For example, we work with David Bourne on the Great Barrier Reef, looking at black band coral disease, something that's a worldwide problem. And the research that's being done in Australia contributes to that worldwide research. So everything we can do to recognise, celebrate, share in and support their work, that's our mission, that's what we aim to do. Hi, I'm Cassandra Nichols. I am the Director of Programs for Earthwatch Australia. We're here today at Lucinda and we're about to head over to Orpheus Island, which is just off Townsville. We have seven volunteers or participants and five researchers. We're going to be over on the island for six days doing the coral research. We'll be seeing firsthand the damage that black band disease is causing to our reef system and also the destruction that the cyclones have. So we're learning from the scientists about what's causing it and what we can do to help. My name's David Bourne. I work at the Australian Institute of Marine Science and my speciality is in marine microbiology, um, so marine microbial ecology, uh, with a particular focus on corals, coral microbiology and coral disease. Coral reefs are vital for millions of people around the world. So they're not only areas of great beauty and attract a lot of tourists, they are also really important for providing a source of protein and livelihoods for, for millions of people, especially in developing countries. So in the last 30 years, we've seen a rapid decline in coral reefs, where current estimates say there's about 20% of reefs have been effectively destroyed, where there's no hope for their recovery. Within the next 10 to 20 years, there's another 20 to 30% under serious degradation and risk of collapse. So by about 2050, the estimates say about 50% of our coral reefs in the world will be gone. Corals um, here and around the world are really facing um, both global pressures, such as climate change, where we have increasing sea surface temperature, which can cause bleaching, and acidification, which causes the, the skeletons to not calcify as much or to calcify more slowly or not as strongly. And because corals are the backbone of the reef, this can be a real problem. Um, and also with more severe weather events, we're seeing that we've got more rainfall and we have a lot more fresh water taking with it contaminants from the land and taking those into the regions where we have corals and other organisms like seagrasses. So there's, uh, there are the global issues, but the corals are also facing local issues where we have pollution getting into the water. We know that over time, um, the Great Barrier Reef has been declining in health. There is a lot of coral loss. We can attack that in a few ways, but we think that one of the best ways that we can do it is to make sure that the water quality is as good as possible. And we can best do that by discovering which of the types of pollutants are affecting corals and other organisms the most and by how much. And so by doing that, we'll enable management to um, set better guidelines and for users of the land to improve farming practices and um, industrial practices so that we can keep the quality of the water on the reef um, up to standard. So today we're heading out to a site that um, got ripped up pretty badly by Cyclone Yassi, so all the coral got removed. I think some of the prior trips they set up some 10 by 10 metre transects with some star pickets and um, I'm going to try and find those first. <laughs> and then um, 
going in and measuring the corals that have been coming back, their size, their growth rates. Yeah, it should be good. A few years ago there was a major cyclone, Cyclone Yashi, that came through and it devastated this coral reef. So over the last couple of years we've been mapping and trying to understand how the corals have been recovering to that devastation. So we have the volunteers working with us here and they take certain areas which we've mapped out and they go through and count and measure the corals that are, that are actually recovering on this reef. And we're seeing quite a lot of recovery actually. If there's no further pressures on this reef in terms of cyclones for example, or other major bleaching events, then we should see some nice recovery. It's actually a real thrill to see a coral two centimetres long or four centimetres long and starting to poke up amongst all the debris. It is initially quite hard to comprehend um, how something so big can be damaged, but um, just by seeing how quickly we move through each of the transits, you can appreciate how much coral was lost. The engagement between Ames and Earthwatch has been very valuable. The volunteers have been extremely helpful in the field in terms of they allow us to do our work quicker. Because underwater we need to do a lot of measurements and we're able to engage the volunteers in helping us do those measurements so we can divide into teams and spread the workload across more teams. Now we're sitting on the beach in West Boris having our lunch. It's a lovely view behind us um, out to Hinchinbrook Island. This afternoon we're going to jump on the boats and do a quick dive just off the beach here. And we're looking for one species of coral in particular that we want to sample and take back to the lab to process. Once we've done that sampling, we're also going to go into the channel to get some more diseased corals. So we know there's an outbreak of black band disease in the channel and we're going to jump in there try and fragment out some pieces of black band disease colonies and take them back to the lab. Black band forms a really complex microbial consortium which means there's a whole mix of different microorganisms that act together to form a toxic environment. The corals do not like that environment in terms of it's very anoxic which means there's no oxygen and it's full of sulphide like that rotten egg gas smell. The tissues underneath that microbial lesion actually lies and fall away and die and the lesion progresses across the coral so it can move about two centimetres a day and can rapidly kill the coral underneath. My name is Yui Sato. I'm a postdoc researcher at Ames. Um, I've been studying uh, coral disease, particularly one called black band disease. Uh, it's been about six years I've uh, been studying in a particular subject at this uh, island called Orpheus Island. So the main purpose of this project is to assess how much impact or damage is actually being caused by black band disease in the coral populations. And also we are very interested in the environmental factors which are driving these patterns of outbreaks around here. And what sort of the temperature or what sort of the nutrients are affecting the disease uh, or um, gen in general health of corals. So far we found that uh, temperature and light uh, is actually driving uh, the disease outbreaks. Uh, so it suggests that um, if this uh, climate change leads to warmer world, uh, corals will have some problem with this coral disease. The way we study coral diseases is by two ways. First of all, we need to figure out about the prevalence on the reef itself by conducting broad scale surveys. So we go to different reefs all along the Great Barrier Reef, all different places actually in the world, and along transit lines we actually monitor the health state of individual coral colonies and scoring actually how many corals are infected with diseases and what kind of diseases. Afterwards we would want to really figure out a little bit more about who are the main players that have the main roles in the disease itself. And for doing that we actually need to go down to the reef and harvest diseased corals. So we actually break fragments of corals and then retrieve them and take them to the lab. We take a coral fragment and we use a mechanism of air blasting the coral tissue. And by retrieving all the tissue itself and leaving behind only the bare skeleton, 
we can get all the aggregation of the live coral tissue and all the microorganisms that live within it. And through that, we are potentially will be able to pinpoint the actual causative agents that are causing the disease itself. Well, yesterday, while everyone else was out diving on the boats and collecting samples, I stayed on shore and helped uh, Dr. Yui Sato set up a, a temperature-controlled laboratory experiment. He wants to set up a, an environment where the black band disease-affected coral can be kept in two conditions, uh, variations of light intensity and variations of temperature. We are testing this effect of the light and temperature, but this time we are looking at the, how active the pathogens are. Uh, the way we look at it is uh, using the molecular techniques to see the gene expression of these complex microbiome communities. We have a very good understanding of the environmental drivers of, of this disease now, and also what's happening from the microbial perspective. And therefore that'll give us some way to try and see if we can actually prevent disease outbreaks and reduce the impact of the disease on the coral population. Black band disease is global. It can be found almost anywhere you go. In any reef, any system, it'll be there. So research from this project, for example, is applicable to other sites around the world. We find very similar microbial communities within the lesion. So it seems like there's a standard consortia or a standard group of microorganisms that cause this disease. So the research that we can do here can help other areas and other regions of the world. We've um, really lapped all this up. It, yeah, it doesn't feel like we're here to work. It seems like that's just a small part of enjoying the environment. The whole place is idyllic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's lovely and well appointed and an easy pace. You know, you're out on the boat. It's beautiful. Yesterday, the lovely sunset. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the banter amongst the group is, is great. Yeah. We've met two people who've worked with or their parents have worked with David Attenborough. Excuse me, this is just sort of stuff you'd never think you'd do. You start off working with a team and you finish the evening working as a team and then relax in each other's company. So it's a very different holiday. Earthwatch is a very important partner for us and what I always am quite surprised about every time I do these trips is the enthusiasm of the volunteers. I just can't stop smiling. Um, it's fantastic, it's really relaxing. Um, something I always really wanted to do was come up here and experience the Great Barrier so for me it's um, very um, tick off the personal life list I think, yeah for sure. So by coming out on an Earthwatch expedition, the general public actually becoming more aware of how scientists collect their data. So then when they're reading things in the newspaper or watching the news, they actually can understand how these conclusions are being drawn. So they physically see and first-hand experience the hard work that goes into collecting that information. It's really opened my eyes and so it's not as easy as just popping up for a couple of days, doing a little quick survey, come back and saying, well, this is how it works. Um, it's a much more complicated environment um, and it's been fantastic to appreciate that.